all to be able to gather here in observation of another seventh day Shabbat. Told Yah for bringing us from one end of the work week even unto this very moment where we can all sigh in relief and give praise unto his Kodesh name for whatever nonsense we dealt with up until this point, we can put it on hold. We can put it on the back burner. We can discard it and put it on the shelf. Focus on Almighty Yahweh. And at this time, dear family, I simply ask that we all rise as we open in prayer. Almighty Father, we come before you ever so humbly on the seventh day Shabbat, giving Torah and Hosannas unto your Kodesh name for breathing the breath of life into each and every one of our vessels once again. We told you for allowing us to be able to arise and stand upon this earth and to be able to go about our day-to-day -day activities and to travel freely. We told you for the legions of angels in which you dispatched on the behalf of every one of your servants to guide us, to watch over us, to protect us, and to preserve us, as well as to shield us from all manners of hurt, harm, and danger. We told you for the deliverance from all trials, tribulations, and persecutions. We told you for your healing from all manner of afflictions, whether they be bodily afflictions, spiritual afflictions, emotional, or any other afflictions. Abba Yahweh, we told you for your deliverance from each and every one of them. And we ask of you also that you remember those of your people who may still be in beds of affliction. And we beg of you that at the time appointed, you deliver them and restore unto them an even greater state of health. And Father, we beg of you also that you remember our adversaries, remember our oppressors, those who persecute us without a cause in this lifetime. And we ask that the same level of malevolence in which they deliver toward us and the same level of evil in which they pursue us with, Abba Yahweh, we ask that you turn your angels against them, Abba Yahweh, Persecute them with the same fervor. And Father Yahweh, we beg of you also that everything in which they desire to have unto, happen unto your people, we ask that you allow those things to turn and fall upon their own heads. Father Yahweh, we beg of you also that you destroy all of their strongholds that they look forward to for strength and break down every weapon in which they seek to utilize against your people. And we beg of you also that as you fight our adversaries and as we see the judgment of our adversaries, we ask that you allow us to not get arrogant or high-minded, but instead allow us to lift up our tongues and our mouths and our hands on high so as to give praise unto you for overthrowing our enemies. And we beg of you also that you please in these latter days cleanse us of everything that's unacceptable and displeasing before you, Father. Wash all of those things far from us and remove far from us also the desire to even continue in those things. But instead, replace those things with the fruits of your Ruach HaKodesh. And Father, we beg of you also that you please make the distinction in these latter days between real and true Israel, as well as the imposters, the posers, and the fraudulent, the masqueraders, your people on a global stage, Abba Yahweh. Make the distinction between those who obey your will and those who just pretend to do your will. And Father, we beg of you that you please have mercy upon us and allow us to be found favorable and acceptable enough in your sight that at the end of our days, we're able to be presented before your judgment throne and to hear your son, Yahshua HaMashiach, welcome us into your kingdom for having done all that we could to strive and to be found favorable and acceptable before you. Abba Yah, we ask these things of you ever so humbly. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, we pray. Hallelujah. 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 Dear family, you can feel free to take your seats. Again, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here gathered before each and every one of you in the Bay of Almighty Yahweh one more time. I want to open this portion of our incoming Sabbath observance reading from the book of Tehillim. Well, I'm open with Psalm 83. Keep not thou silence, O Yahweh, and hold not your peace, and be not still, O Yahweh. For lo, your enemies make a tumult, and they that hate you have lifted up their heads. They've taken crafty counsel against your people. And they've consulted against your hidden ones. And they've said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they've consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against you, the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarenes, Gebel and Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also is joined with them. And they've helped the children of Lot. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Yabin at the brook of Kisun, which perished at Endor, and they became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles or their rulers like Oreb and like Zeb. Yeah, all their princes as Zeba and Zelmuna, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of Elohim in possession. O my Elohim, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. As the fire burns a wood, 
And as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so persecute them with your tempest and make them afraid with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, O Yahweh, that they may seek your name, O Yahweh, and let them be confounded and troubled, O Lam, or forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that you, whose name alone is Yahweh, art the most high over all the earth. And may Almighty Yahweh continually answer the prayer of all of Israel who resort to these psalms, psalms such as this one, 83, 59, 35, 57, and all of the other imprecatory psalms in prayer. In these latter days, may Almighty Yahweh hear the prayers of every one of his servants who has to cry out against the wicked in this earth and who have to pray prayers like this. May Yahweh move continually on our behalf from now until Yahshua HaMashiach comes. For those of you that are with us online as well as in person, if you have notepads and pens, you can simply title tonight's message, Tighten Up the Noose, Turn Up the Heat, and Let's Watch What Happens. Because what we want to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about the tribulation period. We're going to talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to talk about the persecution and the suffering that Almighty Yahweh is going to send his people through. But also we're going to talk about it, if you will, from a two-sided standpoint, sort of like the 50 cent piece or like the coin that the referees flip in the air at the football games to decide who gets the ball, you know, them coins, heads and tails. Both of us, we're going to talk tonight concerning the tribulation, but we're going to do it. We're going to talk about it from the standpoint of the righteous as well as the wicked, because the wicked have to be told, yeah, okay, though you may intend to turn the heat up on Yahweh's people, though you may intend to tighten the noose around our necks, ain't no way in the world Almighty Yahweh is going to allow the wicked to make life in this earth a living hell for his people and the wicked themselves not feel the intensity of the same heat. Ain't no way in the world Almighty Yahweh is going to allow the wicked to put his people's neck in the noose and they themselves not suffocate and gasp for air at the same time. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. This is the message. Yes, Israel, you got tribulation to go through. You got suffering to endure. You got persecutions to withstand. But at the same time, the people responsible for your suffering and your persecution, they're going to feel the pinch just as well. And I hate to have to use such an example as this one, but just as they think they're going to inconvenience you, they too going to be inconvenienced in the same manner. It's like a person farting in a crowded elevator. Yeah, I, I, said, I hate to have to use that example, but at the same time, anybody that's ever had to endure such an ordeal, you know, the person, there's somebody on there is the culprit. Somebody's responsible, but whoever's responsible, they'll stand there and just... They'll look around and turn around and look in your face like you the one bust the fart, like you the one cut the cheese and they'll stand there. Hmm. Whole time knowing they fully responsible, but yet they inconvenience everybody on the elevator and themselves. But yet at the same time, the wicked, they're going to do the same thing in the world. You may feel the pinch at the gas pump. You may feel the pinch at the supermarket, you know. You may look up, if those of you that are renters, you may feel it. Every time you got to renew the lease and you look up and you see the lease renew and you, well, damn, I, 74 more dollars? Damn, I just gave you 63 last year and, and y'all ain't done nothing. Y'all ain't cut no trees. Y'all ain't repaved the parking lot. Y'all ain't put down no new markers. Man, y'all ain't done nothing at all but made it harder to live in this building. But yeah. Those are the types of things that Yahweh's people are going to have to suffer. You may look at your paychecks and go, wow, okay, Uncle Sam taking a bigger cut out of it this week. And he ain't even my relative. He ain't even related to me. Wow. Then you look up, you see health insurance taking a bigger portion and everything else that you can think of taking bigger chunks out of your money. But yet, the people you're working for, they ain't giving you no pay increases to match. But yet at the same time as the wicked, the lawmakers and the policy makers that set all of this stuff in motion, the corporate heads that finance and back their little puppets down in Washington, D.C. on Pennsylvania Avenue, the people who finance and sanction all of this, they're going to feel the pinch too. 
Because there ain't no way in the world you're going to keep on raising the prices of everything and still have the consumers at the bottom of the totem pole still forever able to dance and perpetually keep up. Eventually, you hit a point of critical mass where you can produce and produce and produce and raise the price of everything. Eventually, your consumers are tapped out and you end up with a bunch of products and merchandise with no place to go, nobody to buy it, or nobody to even sell it to. But yet, these are the types of things that's going to accompany the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. Think it's a joke? Scripture talks about the houses being unoccupied or not inhabited. But then you hear America on the news, you jump out of the scriptures and you listen to what they talk about on the daily news. Oh, the, the prices of this, home ownership is down, this, that, and the other. Millennials and Gen Z, they're looking forward to buying houses later in life than their counterparts or the baby boomers. This is all stuff that they set in motion. But at the same time, you're not going to be able to price the people out of the housing market and think that the housing market is going to still stay afloat when nobody's able to buy the real estate. But these are the types of things that Israel has to be forewarned about. Yeah, things are going to get tight, but at the same time, while they're seeking to choke you to death, they themselves are going to suffocate also. Let's jump in here. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 24. go to Isaiah chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Behold, Yahweh makes the earth empty and makes it waste and turns it upside down, just like the time frame in which we're living in today. Everything in which you can think of, those of you that are alive, that's my age and older, you can remember a better quality of life than what the world abides under currently. But everything that happened that you all remember is the good old days. Everything's been flipped upside down. That which used to be frowned upon is now applauded and praised. And that which used to be exalted and uplifted and promoted is now trampled underfoot. And he turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. People, nations, people traveling from nation to nation, people here born in this country. Things get too tight in that country. They flee, go elsewhere. Then they get there to where they're going. They get somewhere else and they realize, oh, no, this isn't it. Nope, got to flee here. Got to flee there. The inhabitants of the nations being scattered abroad, just as the scripture says. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests. So if the people going through hard times, the real true messengers, they going through hard times as well. Now, I ain't talking about the false prophets. They get you in the church. They get you there. They just make 1,500 offerings in a 90-minute service, and they got the Bentley or the Aston Martin or whatever luxury car they pull up into the service. I ain't talking about them. Now, Scripture says it shall be as with the people, so with the priests. So if people got hard times, the true messengers of Yahweh, they right there in the thick of it too. And in fact, as I came to read, said to me years ago, when hard times really hit and things really get tight, Yahweh would allow the priesthood to go through it first so as to be able to give the people the insight, the counsel, and the instruction on how to get through it and what to do when it comes around and it transitions from the priest to the rest of the people. And also, as with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury or interest, so with the giver of interest or usury to him. Everybody, all across the board, everybody struggling. Those that are selling the products and the merchandise that we all buy every day, they struggling to sell the stuff and get the stuff off the store shelves. And then those of us that's buying the things, we struggling to pony up the money to go buy whatever it is, whether it's your gas, whether it's your internet, whether it's to pay for your utilities, whether it's to so much as buy the tomatoes that you need for your salad or whatever the case may be. People struggling just to make ends meet. And you think for one second that Almighty Yahweh wouldn't allow that same struggle to be felt by the corporate heads of them corporations that sit on those boards of Fortune 500 and Forbes 400 companies? You think Yahweh ain't going to allow them to feel the pinch and the sting of it too when you're no longer able to go and buy and shop here or shop there and all these different places? And goes on further and says, The land shall be utterly empty and utterly spoiled, for Yahweh has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. 
And the hardy people of the earth, they do language. See, they gonna feel it too. Those people that sit high and look low. Those people that are doing so well that they can't even feel the struggles of a single mother. Or those people that look so high and look down and look so low at you that they can't understand what it's like for a father getting up at four o'clock in the morning in the dark to go provide for a family that he won't see until well after 6.30 or seven o'clock at night when it's dark because he's struggling to provide for them. The rich, the high-minded, the hardy. You think Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, and all them, you think they feel your struggle? You think they feel your pain? You think they feel what you feel when you go to the gas pump and you struggling between whether you're gonna put gas in the car or food in the refrigerator? You think they feel that? They are, they don't feel it yet, but they gonna feel a different type of pinch because as the saying goes, after so long of a time, when the poor run out of things to eat, things will get so tight, the poor won't have anything to eat but the rich. The rich, they'll feel the pinch in another way. Like me and Minister Taylor were talking earlier, we were talking about society and so many different facets now where they're putting so many security measures in place and there's so many things that they're doing now to protect themselves. But yet at the same time, you ain't going to put no measures in place to protect yourself from that which Yahweh has foreordained to happen to you. You can hide in all the underground bunkers you choose. You could go, you could put all the security on top of, inside and underneath all your courthouses. You could put metal detectors in your hospitals or wherever it is you want to secure yourself. You ain't going to insulate yourself from Yahweh's wrath, but for so long. And the rich, the same goes for them. While we struggling to pony up money to pay for food and gas and all these other things as the poor in this society, they struggling to provide security for themselves to keep you and you from jumping over that fence, over that gated community. They trying to secure themselves from you hopping over that wall or getting past that security guard to just get at the crumbs of their fortune. And Yahweh says further by the mouth of the prophet, he says the earth is defiled also under the inhabitants thereof. So if the world messed up, they talking about the environment, they talking about the hole in the ozone layer, global warming and all of these things. Ain't but one person to blame for this. And you can't blame Yahweh and you can't blame Dontrell on the corner of Pennsylvania and Lawrence selling whatever it is he's selling. You can't blame Man Man on the corner of Patterson Park and Monument doing what he do. You can't blame the brothers in the street. You can't blame the sister around the corner either. Nope. Mm -mm. The environment messed up. The world messed up. You got to look square at Western civilization. Only one group of people has brought forth the damage and the destruction that the earth has seen inside of not even a whole millennium. They ain't even had a whole thousand years to do all of this. One group of people has done more damage from the time Christopher Columbus brought his ass over to this part of the world in 1492 up until today. Only one group of people. You can say African, well, the African, they, they were selling slaves. They were doing that. Okay, yeah, we may have had our own tribal conflicts and things of that nature, but yet at the same time, even in the midst of all of our tribal conflicts, we had certain levels and degrees of respect for one another. We had certain levels and degrees of respect for the creator. We had varying levels and degrees of respect for the environment and nature in general. One group of people shows up on the planet. Got to turn everything upside down. The mountain. Been there for millenniums. Thousands of years. Hey, look, you know what? Let's blow that one up. We're going to blow that mountain up. We're going to make a complex. We're going to make high rises here. We're going to put a Walmart, the Target, a Trader Joe's there. We're going to put a Chick-fil-A over here. And, you know, there's another mountain over there. You know what? We're so self-centered and so vain. You know what we're going to do? We're, no, we're not going to blow that one up. But what we're going to do, we're going to take who we consider our greatest presidents. And we're going to deface that mountain with their faces, Mount Rushmore. And then when we get done defacing this mountain over here, we're going to go to this nation over there. We're going to pollute this. We're going to tear that down. We're going to go over there. We're going to pollute their shores and their oceans. Then we're going to go and purify that. After we pollute the shoreline, we're going to pollute it. We're going to tear that up. We're going to purify the water. And then we'll take it over here and we'll sell it to the school children in Detroit for $7.50 a bottle. 
because water is not a natural right, but it's a commodity. That's what the CEO of Nestle said years ago. It wasn't something that you should have a right and access to, but this one group of people brought the earth to the brink of destruction in such a short period of time. And now they're going to squeeze Yahweh's people in such a way where they want to squeeze you out of existence altogether. As this opening psalm said, they've confederated, they've come together to say, come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. But to show you how merciful or full of Hasid Yahweh is, every time they try, they fail miserably. Scripture says in the book of Isaiah that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. At every turn, they try to wipe you out. They try to destroy you. They try to kill you. And as they go forth with their plots, Almighty Yahweh said, nope, that ain't happening. We'll, we'll drag them through slavery. We'll, we'll take them from their homeland. We'll bring them to this part of the world. We'll humiliate them. We'll embarrass them. We'll bring them naked and bare with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Only this time, we'll take them to a country that we'll call the United States. We'll work the hell out of them. We'll try to beat the hell out of them. And those that we don't beat the hell out of will rape, lynch, murder, and kill. But yet, they still continue to reproduce themselves. Then you go on through. You take the chains off of them. You bring them through Jim Crow, separate but equal, all of that stuff. Then you come on in. You get them through the 50s and 60s, the prohibition and all of that. You give them liquor. You give them alcohol, hoping they drink themselves to death. They go on off. They get cirrhosis of the liver. But before they die of cirrhosis of the liver, they done had nine children in four different families. And the nine children go on, and they start their own family. And they go off and they produce another generation of children. But the initial one you were mad at and wanted to kill, he then created so many offspring. And then this has happened through Israel's history so many times. Then you get to the point where black people decide, they decide they're going to love one another and they're going to fight on the global stage. You get to the 50s and the 60s, you gun down all the vocal troublemakers, all of the leaders, all of the rebel routers. You kill all of them, you gun down Martin, Malcolm, Medgar, and so many others. You kill all of them, but then black people, they produce and continue to produce more and more. Then you give them heroin, you give them crack, you give them drugs, you give them sexually transmitted diseases, hoping that they'll wipe themselves out. Then you give them more and more guns, more and more narcotics, and yet they still here, still reproducing through the 70s, the 80s, 21st century. You had a whole generation of young men and women that were selling drugs in the 80s, who CNN and Nightline and other news outlets here in America forecasted. Many of them won't see the age of 21. But yet, many of them today, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they didn't produce children and grandchildren who are still here, still going. So the wicked, as they work to bring about your demise, it's clear it's got to be told to them, hey, you ain't going to put the noose on our neck and you not suffocate at the same time. Even one of their presidents, Abraham Lincoln, even had enough damn sense to tell them when speaking in regards to black people and the need to separate, he said that it was imperative that black people be separated from the whites in the United States because he said that black people suffer in the United States as long as they are here in proximity to white folks. And then he also said that white folks suffer because of us and because of our presence. Now, I'm not even aware if he fully understood the magnitude of what he was saying. But you got to keep in mind what Yahweh said concerning his people. Yahweh said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. You wanted to have us in your possession so bad because you knew that whoever possessed the children of Israel, the blessings of the Most High would rest upon them. So you specified when you went to Africa, you wanted to take us, and you wanted to take us exclusively. Well, now you got us. And we're here, you want us to leave. But we ain't leaving till Almighty Yahweh makes the call for us to go. But yet, as the scripture says, the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, not the Constitution, not the laws of Maryland or Detroit, but the laws of the Most High. 
They've transgressed them. They got men with men, women with women, men trying to dress up as children so that they can be with children and all sorts of other perversion. You got all sorts of whoredom and perversion going on today. They have it the way they promote all sorts of things that the scripture speaks against. Scripture tells you to not prostitute your daughter as a harlot, lest the land fall to whoredom. They'll promote all of that today. Oh, go on, girl. It's a girl. It's it's a hot girl summer. This is women's liberation. This is female empowerment. Go on off, girl. If you want to be with that nigga, go ahead and be with him. If you want to be with Brad, go be with Brad and Chad and James too. Girl, go on off. Be with all of them. Don't let them shackle you down. Don't let them shame you with their toxic masculinity. Go on off. Do what you want to do, girl. It's all about empowerment. And all of these different things. And then you wonder why. It was the relationships in shambles, the divorce rate, as high as a dope fiend down Lexington Market. But yet, the matrimony, null and void. And then they go on off. The scripture talks about the men. The scripture talks about them and what they were supposed to do. And then it talks about how things would get so bad. Yeah, I always said that things would get so tight that Seven women would take hold of one man, and the brothers like that verse. The brothers, they, yeah, shoot, give me all seven of mine, and since he, give me his too. The brothers like that verse, but they don't really want to look into what precedes that verse. And it ain't saying it in the sense that it's going to be one man just running through and fornicating with seven women. Uh-uh, things going to get so tight. Yeah, I was going to get so upset with his people, he going to wipe out a great majority of them. And that's how you get to that time frame where Things are so tight with seven, it's seven women to one man because Don Trell then got killed by Leon over here. And then Leon got locked up and he then went to jail. So then in turn, Leon done been in jail so long, he burning inwardly in his own lust toward his cellmate. So he doing the unthinkable in jail. Then he comes out years later, he gets killed. And then so many others and it goes on. So many different things go on to reduce the male population which is why you get to that time frame where it's seven to one. But the brother, yeah, yeah, give me my seven. Nah, if you knew what the scripture really said, you sit back, you'd humble yourself. Especially if you read up in there where Isaiah talks about how Yahweh will make a man more rare than the fine gold of Ophir. And you get to looking up about that gold of Ophir. You didn't just get there any kind of way and go about taking that gold. You didn't just go on there in and out like they do the snatch and grabs at Neiman Marcus today. But yeah, let's go on a little bit further in here. Now they done broke the laws. They done transgressed the laws. They done changed the ordinance and they broke in the everlasting covenant. So all of these things the people have done. This is why the earth is defiled. This is why the quality of life has been diminished in every way, shape, and form. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell there in a desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned up, and few men left. Now let's go on a little bit. Let's go into the book of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel lays out some things as well that we need to look at as far as what's going on in hard times and adversity and persecution is coming down the pipe. Ezekiel 7, 12 says, For the time has come, the day draws near. Let not the buyer rejoice or the seller mourn. So it come time where neither party in the business transaction will feel anything. It won't be no buyer's rejoicing, no seller's remorse, no vice versa, nothing. It'll be to the point where it'll be contentious on both sides. Let not the buyer rejoice nor the seller mourn. For wrath is upon all the multitude there, price of everything so high. The one that's thinking he's going to rip somebody off, he ain't even making a profit out of it. And the one that's doing the buying, he thinking he done jewed somebody down, but in the end, he didn't lowball himself or he didn't get a break. End up still getting robbed and everything is reduced to nothing as far as quality and value goes. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, or they, they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof, which shall not return. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. Things will be so tight you won't even be able to brag and boast on whatever little wicked things you do, whatever little pernicious ways you might have, won't even be able to boast in it. Things will be just that tight. As the saying goes, here today, gone tomorrow. Well, things are getting so tight now where it's here today, gone today. The value of life just reduced to nothing. People take a life over absolutely nothing and do it so quick. And if we think it's bad now, just wait until Yahweh really turns up the heat. 
They've blown the trumpet, even to make all ready. Messengers sounding the alarm, messengers crying out, preaching Yahweh's word, trying to get the people's attention, let the people know, hey, look, times are tight, times are getting shorter, the days are drawing nearer and nearer to the return of Yahshua HaMashiach. Ready yourselves, get your soul ready, get your house in order. Messengers sounding the trumpet, sounding the alarm, people taking it as a joke, thinking this again. But they did the same thing in the days of Noah. Noah preached 120 years. Nobody paid him no mind. Until one day, somebody looked up. Man. Water. Then suddenly, the rain came. And the rain came down, and then Yahweh opened up the depths of the sea and the rivers in the earth and allowed the waters to come up out of the earth as well. Then suddenly, oh man, you know what? He said it was going to rain. Then suddenly, when the ark was constructed and Yahweh had told Noah which animals to gather into the ark, then suddenly everybody wanted to... Now, if it, was, if it was to happen today, you could hear, man, a nigga crazy. Man, a nigga talking about Yahweh going to flood the earth, this, that, and that. Man, ain't nobody try to hear that, man. Yahweh, it ain't even... How you even know it's somebody up there on the other side of the cloud? If it happened today, you know it would be us. It would be us as the people trying to reason all around it. Man, ain't, what, if it's, like they said in Boys in the Hood, if it's a God, why he be letting niggas get smoked? You, you know us. If, if, if Noah would have been here today in the earth building the ark, it would have been some of us. We'd have been some of his biggest antagonists. Man, Nick, you building a boat for what? Then as soon as the rank, hey, dog, hey, hey. Come on, cuz. Yo, hey, ew. Come on, yo, open. Hey, man, you just gonna leave us all out here like this? Come on, yo, man. Hey, come on, man. It's raining. Come on, hey. You see this water? Come on, man. You, just gonna, you ain't gonna help a nigga out. Come on. You know it would be us. But yet, they've blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none goes to the battle. For my wrath is upon the, all the multitude thereof. The sword is without, and the pestilence and the famine within. And that's serious. Outside the door, all kinds of destruction, all kinds of murder and slaughter and carnage. But inside, pestilence and the famine, disease and starvation, scarcity of food, poor health in the house. But yet, murder and carnage outside. And he that is in the field shall die with the sword. And he that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. But they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys and all of them mourning every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be weak as water. And that's serious. Where your mouth fat in the house. And Yahweh ain't just let this be exclusively confined to Israel. He said all hands shall be feeble and all knees shall be weak as water. You see in the prelude of that now, look at the politicians in Washington. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what to do, but yet they just know, we got to do something. You, you, you. Even if it makes no sense at all, just do something. But they don't know what to do to solve none of the problems that they have. Prices over here, they're fighting with inflation there. They're fighting with immigration. They're fighting with folks coming in at the border. They're fighting with you at the school board concerning your child. They're fighting over here to provide this. They're fighting to keep you from jumping on them about the lies that they told to you during the pandemic or the scamdemic. They're fighting you to keep you off of their back behind all of them lies. They're fighting these folks over here to keep them from asking for more money. They're fighting this group over here to keep from asking for a resolution to their problems. But yet at the same time, it's conflict everywhere, but yet they don't have any solutions to none of it. All hands shall be feeble. Look at your president. Don't get a great example than Sleepy Joe. He get up there, he's so feeble. His hands feeble, his legs feeble, his mind is even feeble. He get up there, he two, three different thoughts come out at the exact same time and none of them make any sense. Remember he was talking about the police brutality? It's a shame the way they beat Tyree Memphis. I think the man's name was Tyree Nichols. They beat Tyree Nichols and killed him down in Memphis. It's a shame the way they beat Tyree Memphis. Going on, hey, but as the saying goes, a nation is only as strong as its leadership. And look who America decided to put up at the helm.
and they shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of Almighty Yahweh. So you ain't going to buy your way out of this one, Warren Buffett. You ain't going to buy your way out of this, Elon Musk. You ain't going to trade Bitcoins for salvation. You ain't going to trade your damn Doge coins to avoid damnation. You ain't going to do it. None of the currencies, paper, fiat, or crypto, none of them going to save you in the day of wrath. And they shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels because it's the stumbling block of their iniquity. And that's the America downfall right there, that damn dollar. Or is, what they say, they refer to it as the almighty dollar. But yet at the same time, it ain't delivered none of them. It ain't delivered those that print it up. It ain't delivered the Federal Reserve. It ain't delivered those that's out in the streets killing and robbing for it. And it certainly ain't going to deliver the soul of the nation who prints it and has it on the back of the money. In God we trust. It's going to deliver none of them. Book of Proverbs says, I believe it's chapter 11, says, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, neither shall they deliver from the day of death. Now, you don't have to go to that one, but I'm just paraphrasing that one as it comes to me. But yet it says here that they shall cast their silver and their gold. They shall throw it in the streets, and it shall be removed, and shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of Yahweh. And neither shall they fill their bowels, because it's the stumbling block of their iniquity. And then we jump on out of Ezekiel and we go here into the book of Daniel. Daniel talks to us in chapter 12 about a time of unprecedented trouble for Yahweh's people. But in the midst of this trouble being so unprecedented, Yahweh lets us know by way of his servant Daniel that while the trouble is like nothing that's been on this earth before, Yahweh's going to deliver us out of it. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Mikael stand up, or one who is like Elohim, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as was never since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. So that's the thing. That's the place to be written in the book. Not at Sam's Club, not at Target, not at uh, whatever the latest nightclub is or not at the latest protest, no. All those that are found written in the book or the Lamb's Book of Life, those are the ones that will be delivered out of this time of unprecedented trouble. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. See, even those that died and went on to sleep, all of those black people who were slaves, all of those people who were shackled, who were taken from their homeland, all of those people who had their children taken from them, all of those people who had their native language, their native tongue and customs whipped and beat out of them just so they could maintain their life. All those people who died being born into Christianity, Jesus, God, the Lord, and all that other garbage, all of those people who died being fed lies all their life of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white Jesus coming to save them while they spend their whole lifetime being beat, raped, sold by blonde-haired, blue-eyed people that look like this supposed savior that's going to come and one day save them and reward them with pie in the sky. That sucks if you really think about it. Suppose you're a person that don't like pie. What Will they have donuts in the sky? I mean, what? Will you get... Uh, Crumpets, or uh, butterscotch crumpets, what? Suppose you don't like pie. But these are the lies that they told to our people. And many of our people died with low self-esteem. Many of our people died with negative images of themselves, thinking that they were worthless, thinking that they had no real value in the earth of any sort. And people died just thinking that their state of living was going to go on and continue for their children and their grandchildren. While on the other side of the coin, the family members of folks like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and others who owned people, abducted folks, made folks work for them for free, raped men and women at their own leisure whenever they got ready. And these men and women, because they were white women whose husbands had slaves as well, and when 
Miss Sally looked up and realized what her husband was doing in that shed with Nefertiti and Natari and all of the other sisters that were stolen from Africa. When she realized what Tom was doing in that shed, she had her bucks as well. And she would force some of them brothers also under some of the cruelest of conditions to come in and copulate with her. And these brothers and these sisters, they died thinking that they were nothing but beasts. While their white counterparts just went on thinking, oh, well, life is grand. Life is grand. At least I am not a nigger. And they thought they would leave all of this wealth to their children and this legacy would go on and continue forever. But many went to their graves thinking that that was it. But as we just read in Daniel, many of them that sleep in the dust. Some shall wake to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You think Thomas Jefferson going to rejoice getting up in the day of judgment knowing that all those people you held in slavery, all those bastard children that you made by way of rape, you think you, you think he getting up in judgment day? You think he getting up? Yes, bring on the salvation. Yes, Jesus, let, let's have it. Nope, mm, he can get the shock of his life just like every other white person that bought into that white Jesus nonsense. When they look up and they see Yahshua HaMashiach, as a man of color, black as me, if not blacker, with, as the scripture says, hair like lamb's wool. Not that nonsense that Demi Moore or Demi Lovato or Taylor Swift got hanging from their scalp and their cranium. Not that nonsense. No, not that fur. No. And many who died thinking that they had no value at all, some of them died living as righteously as they could under the most cruel and horrific conditions, getting up in first resurrection to everlasting life to find out that they had much more value than was ever told to them in this lifetime. The scripture says, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness, you shine as bright as the stars forever and ever. See, in this day and age, everybody wants to teach, everybody wants to preach, everybody wants to be out front. But the one thing nobody takes into consideration is the fact that you're responsible for whatever goes out of your mouth. Whoever it is that you have as an audience, you're responsible for anything that they do. If they're listening to you as a teacher, if you mislead them or you tell them something that's contrary to Yahweh's word, their blood is on your hands. Everybody wants to teach and preach, but think about it. Everybody ain't called to teach and preach. And then some people, they may very well be called to salvation. And as a result of them being called to salvation, they sitting in the temple week in and week out, hearing the things in Yahweh's word. And then somebody may very well look at their life and take a curiosity to what they do. Well, every Saturday, I notice you always get dressed up every Saturday. You go here, you know, you don't go out to the club, you don't party, you don't do this, that, and the other. And then from there, the conversation snowballs. You, well, I don't do this, that, and the other. Well, I keep the Sabbath, this, that, and the other. Well, why don't you drink? Why don't you smoke? And you start talking to people about the things in Yahweh's word. Well, I don't, I don't drink because the scripture says that wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever errs or makes mistakes thereby is not wise. No, uh-uh, no. Scripture say in another place, give wine or strong drink to them that are ready to perish or them that's ready to die. Then you look up and you see, oh, dang, okay, where that's at in the book? Then person's curiosity peaked now. Oh, man, you know what? And then you compel them to go home and look at something. Or you may be talking or you may have a conversation. The subject may not even be related to drugs or alcohol. It may be related to sexual promiscuity or something. And you say something to a person right out of Yahweh's word. And it piques their curiosity. And they go, damn, you know what? I got to look that up. Oh, man. And then they look, see it. They, oh, wow. And you may very well compel a person to drop to their knees and repent based upon something you said to them, your style of delivery or the way in which you conveyed that which you know to be true in Yahweh's word. And as a result, person changed their life. So in turn, you think Yahweh ain't counting that as you haven't turned somebody to righteousness? But yet you ain't never touched the pulpit. You ain't never set up or established the congregation. You ain't never put one Bible lesson together. But you, by way of your living, giving somebody an answer to a question in which they had about your lifestyle, you compel the person to turn to righteousness. But the book of Daniel talks about that unprecedented time of trouble and says that we will be delivered out of it. But we go here to the book of Luke. Let's go on here to Luke chapter 21. 
You get it from Yahshua's mouth himself. Because Yahshua lays out some of the hardships that would befall the earth in these latter days. Yahshua says here in Luke chapter 21, verse 10, he says, Then he says unto them, talking to his disciples now, they ask him questions about the end time. And he says, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Russia against Ukraine, America against Iraq, uh, America against so and so and so, uh, Pakistan against Kazakhstan, Herzegovina against Bosnia, this against that one, and the whole world against you. Nation against nation. And it should be earthquakes in diverse places, famines and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. So all these things playing out today, earthquakes everywhere. Earthquakes in places that never even really had earthquakes. Baltimore had an earthquake years ago. Shook the whole city up. Talked about for days, weeks. Earthquake and a hurricane in the exact same week in August of 2011. You don't believe me? Go back and check the stats. Go back and check Google or if you remember, if you was on, if you was on social media, go back to August of 2020, I mean 2011. Go back, check it if you don't believe me. But I remember it was August of 2011. Baltimore had an earthquake and hurricane, I believe it was Hurricane Irene, same week, but that was all everybody kept talking about. Wow, man, Baltimore ain't never had no earthquake, man, man, niggas was shook up. This is all the stuff people were saying, and like Jonah on the ship, at the time the earthquake happened, I was at work, I was on the truck, sleep. and the brother couldn't believe me when he came out the house and he told me about it, he said, man, you ain't feel that. Man, I thought that was you on the back of the truck. I thought you were moving some plywood around, you know, messing with the generator or something. No, that wasn't me messing with no generator. Nigga, the earth was shaking. I said, the what? I said, man, what? It's not just for real, man. It was an earthquake. So me, I'm going to go back, check Black Folks News Network. Like, you know, let me go on Facebook. Because if the earth shook, if Baltimore had an earthquake, somebody posted it on Facebook. Somebody online about it. On Facebook at that time, sure enough, scrolling through the news feed, everybody. Oh, man, you better get your life right. Man, God is coming. Man, the earth was shaking. I thought I was going to fall through. Oh, man, this is crazy. What in the world coming to, man? Man, the whole earth was shaking. What next? Snow in September? All sorts of stuff going on. And y'all sure laying it out. Earthquakes in diverse places, famines and pestilence. But he says, before all these things, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to their synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Time get tight to where you just keeping Yahweh's commandments and then somebody snatch you up. Somebody sick the authorities on you. Well, they over there keeping the Sabbath. They, well, they doing this, that, and the other. They doing such and such a thing. And brother did it to us here. We were during the pandemic. We were keeping the service. Man ordered, well, the government that is, when I say the man, the governing officials, they ordered that all gatherings of 10 people or more be shut down and restricted. They ordered all churches, mosques, temples, and synagogues be closed, shut down. But yet they let the liquor stores stay open. We were still holding service. Minister Taylor, he was deacon then, as I came that weed in myself. My brother come in, he all talk radio. What well, my pastor, he's still doing... Wow, brother, wow, way, way to go. Throw us under the bus. Why, why not just put us all in the car and rally us all down to the police station? Come on, why not just get us all at your house and let them all come gather us up? But this is what y'all sure said would happen. They lay hands on you. They arrest you, persecute you, lock you up, cause you to be thrown into prisons. And it should turn to you for a testimony. So yeah, it's an inconvenience. It hurts. It upsets your quality of life. You know, it makes you mad. It disrupts your routine. But at the same time, Yahshua said it should turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. Don't get to that point. Do you know what? I'm going to tell them this. I'm going to let them know. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And you talk so much trash, but then when you get down, uh, 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 you forget everything you wanted to say. Like Richard Pryor said when he had to go to court, he, I'm going to let him know. Crack a bastard, I'm going to tell him. I'm, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to let Whitey know what it is. Then he said he got to court and the judge, Mr. Pryor. He said, uh, 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 uh. boy, get up here. Then he said, oh, uh, yes, your honor. All that letting Whitey know what it is went out the window. 
He lost his heart. This is what Yahshua said. Don't don't even meditate what you're going to say. Mm -mm, don't, none of that. When I get down there, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say this. Nope. Yahshua tells you in the next verse. Why? Says, meddle not. Don't, don't even so much as meditate before what you shall answer. For I'll give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Yahshua. I wear the Ruach HaKodesh will place the words in your mouth. Whatever it is you got to say. Whether you're going before a summit, uh, what, court, you've been summoned for jury duty, a trial, whatever the case may be. Let the Ruach HaKodesh lead you and place the words in your mouth at that precise moment. And see if you don't confound and bind whoever it is you got to stand before. And if you do it right and you go in there and you fast and you pray before you get there, see how fast they throw you up out of there. Now, I can, I can tell you from experience. I have been thrown out the courthouse a couple of times concerning the jury duty. They got to the point where they space them out. They, at one point in time, they harassed you every year. Then it got to the point I went in 2013. I was down there. I was down there the Monday morning after they acquitted George Zimmerman of killing Trayvon Martin. They wanted me to show up on the jury then. I raked the judge out, let her know, uh -uh, you ain't gonna hardly get me to do this. No, not at all. I'm not about to put my hand to anybody's witness and anybody's wickedness. Scripture says, let your yea be yea or your nay be nay. I ain't swearing on nothing, especially not when you all hide the truth and you suppress the truth and you all acquit the wicked, but yet you persecute the innocent. I'm not doing this in no way, shape, or form. Go back, woman. My. And at that time, the attorney, popular attorney here in Baltimore, Warren Brown, he was down there that day. He was down there. His defendant had a gun charge and some other stuff. He looking at my jury number. 420. And I seen him pull out a red pen and he put an X on. So I was okay, I'm definitely leaving now. About 15 minutes later. Well, jurors number so and so and so, such and such, and so and so and so, and 420. Please stand. You all are now free to exit the courthouse. So when Yahshua says here, he'll give you a mouth that your enemies will not be able to withstand, you go again, say, nor resist. I know that one by heart. I know that, did that myself. And you should be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kin folks and friends. And some of you, they shall cause you to be put to death. But even knowing that, going back to the title of the message, if they tighten the noose around your neck, or well, if they heat up the furnace for you and turn up the heat, oh well. Watch and see what happens. But there's no way in the world Yahweh is going to allow you as the wicked to put his people to death and there not be some repercussion behind it. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. I done seen Yahweh move too many times on the behalf of his people, especially when they were mistreated. Uh-uh. You ain't going to sell me that one. Yeah, we got the tribulation to go through. Some of us may be killed. Some be put to death. Some persecuted. Some incarcerated and arrested. But at the same time, as the brothers in the street do for one another, you think Yahweh ain't going to ride on the behalf of Israel? You think they tearing stuff up in Memphis now behind the death of Adolph Thornton or the rapper known formerly as Young Dolph? You think Memphis catching hell now in the streets behind Young Dolph being killed and all the people who loved him so much going after those who he had disputes and beefs with in his lifetime. Yeah, you think Memphis catching hell. Wait till Almighty Yahweh ride on the United States. Wait till Almighty Yahweh rides on the USSR. Wait till Almighty Yahweh rides on that damn so-called royal family over there in the United Kingdom on the behalf of his people. Yahweh said in the Psalms, precious in the death of Yahweh. Is his, precious in his sight is the death of his saints. In fact, let me not even quote it, but let's go. I ain't going to paraphrase it. I'm going to go straight to this one. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of Yahweh is the death of his saints. So the person killing you, they may think you absolutely nothing. You may be insignificant to them. You may be just another nigger. You may be another whatever they choose to call you as they choke you out or as they stab you to death or as they gun you down. Whatever the case may be, you may be just another nigger in their eyes, but they don't understand. Almighty Yahweh counts you as the apple of his eye. And don't think for one minute that Yahweh won't rise up to go to war on your behalf. 
scripture tells us that Yahweh is a man of war. I don't know no men of war that don't go out looking to kick ass, and fight, and stretch something out. I don't know no men of war that just, well, you know what? I never really intended on firing this AR-15. You know what? I never really intended on firing this 1911, but you know what? I actually just, I put on all this Kevlar, I put on all of this armor, and I brought my butt to Kuwait to knit and crochet. That, that's all I really wanted to do. I, I just came over here to make blankets and hats, you know? That, that's all. I just came over here to make mittens for the babies. I, I didn't come to fight or kill. Nope. All the men of war go out intending to kill in some way, shape, or form. And another thing they also do, they also have in the back of their mind the possibility that they may not come back. But yet they go out intending to fight with all that they have. And don't think for one second that Almighty Yahweh is not going to fight on the behalf of his people. You, me, all the children of Israel striving in sincerity. So as the wicked turn up the heat, as they apply more pressure to us, don't think for one minute that they're going away unscathed. Don't believe that for one second. Even if they give the appearance of looking like nothing is affecting them. You better look deeper. Better look beyond the surface or the facade that they portray into you on the nightly news or in their publications. Let's go on back a little bit. Let's go back in here to Luke. Right back in here to where Yahshua was talking to us in Luke 21. It says also, and you should be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a head of your hair perish. So in your patience, possess ye your souls. For the updated today, be cool. Chill. Yeah, they're going to put you through some things, but at the same time, even if they destroy the body, Yahshua said, fear not them that destroy the body and afterwards have no more that they can do, but fear him who can destroy both soul and body and cast them into hell. So even if they persecute you and put you to death in this lifetime, don't even worry about it. There's no of a surety. No, no, uh-uh. Okay, yeah, you got that one. Okay. Yeah, all right, you got that one. Now we got the next one and everyone that follow. You just had to, in this lifetime, even if they put you to death, you just had to take that approach that Nipsey Hussle took when he, last time he, last words to his killer. All right, you got me. You got me. After having been shot prior to dying, last words to his killer. All right, you got me. Even in this lifetime, the wicked, those of us that the wicked put to death, had to say that same, all right, okay, you, you got that one. All right, you, you may have stifled the life of the body, but Almighty Yahweh got your soul, and you ain't getting out of that one. Then Yahshua says further, and when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So when they start setting up and staging and putting them troops and them bulwarks and them embattlements there, you know for sure, okay, think almost three o'clock. You know how children used to do in school? <laughs> children start giving them signals. That's if you went to school anytime from the 60s on up to the 90s. That <laughs> three o'clock, children let you know. You and me, as soon as the bell ring. When you start seeing the things that Yahshua said come to pass, you can look at your watch spiritually. Okay? 251. School getting ready to get out. Then let them which are in Yahudah flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them which are in the countries enter therein too. So people rushing to get their passports and flee to be over there right now. That ain't exactly the place to be right now. Mm-mm. You don't want to be over there right now, not at the hotbed of the conflict. It's like hanging out in the street with a person that's getting ready to get killed. person may have had a hit placed upon them, and the contract may have already been paid, the killer's been paid, and all they're doing now, they're just scoping out the neighborhood and just riding around, just watching their target. And right as that person getting ready to be killed, the last thing you want to be doing, sitting down, chopping it up with them. Yeah, go ahead, keep it. Hey, hey, man, roll that up real quick, man. And y'all sitting down. Rolling the blunt, you ready to drink some Crown Royal or some Ciroc or whatever it is, and y'all hanging out, but the person getting ready to get killed any moment now, and you hanging out with them. Yeah, this, that, and the other. And then at the precise moment that the shooting getting ready to start, you high-fiving them, you dapping them up. 
and then the shooting starts. You right there in the midst of it, and you got to run. And then as you running, you got to run now and wonder whether or not they following you, whether or not they recognize your face, whether or not they know anything about you, whether or not they coming to get you. So it's the same thing for those that want to be over there right now. It's the hotbed. It's going to be the seat of the bloodiest battle to ever take place in this earth. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. That would be a terrible time to be a mother, to have a newborn or infant. All hell breaking loose all in the earth. There ain't no supermarkets to run to to get no Similac or no formula. You ain't running the Giant or Target or anything like that. They done put so much pressure on you to where everything shut down. And the thing about it is, even with the mothers who, well, uh, the smart, I don't, I, I don't put my baby in that stuff. I don't need no formula, no milk. I breastfeed naturally anyway. Yeah, but the one thing about it, even in that instance, you, you put mom under enough pressure and you take away enough food and all of the vital nutrients that mom needs in order to produce that breast milk for that baby, mom, them paps will dry up like the desert of Mugabe in a heartbeat. Yeah, I know a little bit about anatomy. I might not have went to school each and every day and stayed all day, but it was certain classes I went and I paid attention to certain things. I know that if nothing else, you put mom under enough pressure and enough stress and you deprive her of enough food or, hey, you get two for one in that instance. Get three if you didn't chase dad out the equation already or he didn't stretch him out already. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. But the one thing that the Gentiles have to realize, you got a specified amount of time in this earth to cut up. Yahweh is treating them like a parent that has a disobedient child. You, the parents, you can relate to what I'm about to say. Any of your parents, any of you as parents or any of your parents ever had to get a hold of you. You had them days where you cutting up something fierce. And I'm speaking now, I, I'm speaking from my own experience. You cutting up and they being merciful. All right, okay, you keep on going. I, I done said stop. All right, okay, go ahead. All right, I got you. Okay, all right, yeah, go ahead. Continue, keep on going. And they start talking to you like a certain mother that I know, a certain Emma who I won't name, but they get to talking to you through their teeth. All right, yeah, you keep on going. Boy, when we get home, it's, it's you and me. I've got something for you, and you ain't going to want this. And they keep on going, and that's how Yahweh treating the Gentiles, letting them cut up till the time appointed. When you get frustrated, that's it. As Brother Tim would say, it's a done deal. Told him to go ahead on till the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. But let's go to Matthew chapter 5 real quick. This one point that Yahshua made here in verse 45. But I'm going to go to verse 44 first. But the central point of what I'm focusing on is in verse 45. But I say unto you, Matthew 5, 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this ain't no prayer of no blessing now. Yahweh, bless them as they continue to rape our women. Bless them, Yahweh, as they continue to lynch the brothers and hang them from the trees. Yahweh, be with them. Continue to strengthen them as they come up with all sorts of new atrocious ways to kill it. Nah, mm -mm. you want to pray for them to despitefully use you? Hey, that's Psalm 35, Psalm 59, Psalm 83, Psalm 109. Excellent ways to pray for them this despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be children of your father which is in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good so just as Yahweh allows the sun to shine on the righteous as well as the wicked also he sends rain on the just and on the unjust so just as Yahweh allows the sun to shine on the righteous and the wicked and he allows the rain to shine or the rain to prevail upon the just and the unjust the judgment and the tribulation period going to fall upon us both in the same manner they think they're going to hurt us they think they're going to persecute us you're going to make life so inconvenient for us you're going to raise the prices of everything except wages and you think you're going to price us out of existence and you yourselves continue to thrive? Oh, no. Mm -mm. Better pay attention to what's going on in the United States now. We were just talking last Shabbat. 
after everybody had left, we were talking about the real estate crisis in America and how they complain, especially in big cities like New York, of all them unoccupied office buildings. See, all those different things. You come up with this plague. You spread this plague throughout the world because you wanted to use this particular plague and this disease as a means of resetting life as everybody knows it. You come in, everybody go in the house. Everybody home now. Go in the house. Don't even go to your job. In fact, forget your job. We'll pay you to stay home and we'll give you more money to stay home than we gave you while you went to work. So many people, folks, I know folks that was getting four and five hundred dollars every two weeks on their job. But when the pandemic hit, they was coming back. Man, they done gave me, boy. One brother I know, man, they gave a nigga $1,100 this week, yo. I said, they gave you what? He, man, I had $1,100 this week. And I got another one coming next week. I said, boy, you don't even make that in a month. I know, boy. This, man, this could go. They ain't got to rush no time soon. Dr. Fucci in them. I said, Fauci. Yeah, whoever it is, Gucci, Lucci, whoever. They ain't got to rush to get no cure for this, yo. If they giving me money like this, this, man, this could go on to 2050. At this rate, man, what? All of these different things going on. They ran everybody home. Then they come on in. You know what? You don't even have to come to your job. You, 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 and you. We have this new thing. We're going to call it hybrid working. You don't have to come into the office. Here, here's a laptop for you. Yes, yes, take that. You can work from home. Yes, you too. You scared to come out? Hey, here, you work from home as well. So in turn, you went with the hybrid work style for ever so many years. Now, people don't want to go back to work. People don't want to return to the office building. They say in New York City alone, they said New York got a vacancy rate of about 20 to 21%. And that's just the office buildings, Ema. It, this ain't even residential stuff. This just them offices, them high rises. And they say it ain't been that high. Their vacancy rate ain't been that high since the 80s. One in five, every, all them office buildings, vacant, unoccupied. And so many of them, they say about, I think they say it's about $1.3 trillion dollars as far as lease renewals, is scheduled to come up inside of the next two years, just in the state of New York alone, as far as office buildings. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yep, here it is. And that's just New York here. But then they're doing it in Detroit. They going through it. And they going through it in Baltimore. They going through it in the major cities here down in Dallas and so many other places. All these office buildings just vacant, lying dormant. Then it's a whole different story when you start talking about the residential properties. They've been vacant for so long that they just can't sell them. But yet, prices steadily going up. But the prices of the wages for the workers? Nah. The prices of the real estate, the office buildings and everything through the roof. But you and I, our wages, somewhere down in the basement. Struggling to see the light of day. But these are the types of things that I mean when I say they ain't going to be able to tighten the noose on our neck and they not suffocating gas for air at the same time. Book of Isaiah talks about it. Let's go on in here. Let's go back to Isaiah 24. There ain't no way in the world y'all were going to allow them to put so much pressure on us and they themselves continue to laugh at your misery and at your, your hell and your turmoil. There ain't no way. <clears throat> Isaiah 24, 7 says, The new wine mourns, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted do sigh. All them happy folks, say, yeah, ain't, ain't no. where Bobby McFerrin at now? Don't worry, be happy. What Pharrell Williams doing now? Yeah, because I'm happy, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Yeah, that wasn't realistically look at it. it. Ain't nothing to be singing about. That sound like a tornado. That sound like the after effects of a tornado. I mean, realistically, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. What happened to the roof? What? But then again, this America. So I guess the builders ran out of money. I guess the contract ran out. They wasn't funded. It sounds like the aftermath of a hurricane or a tornado to me, a room without a roof. But yet you look at him now, you see him, he worn out now. He look older than he ever looked now. So much going on. Scripture says the new wine mourns, the vine languishes, and all the merry hearted. <sighs> they do sigh. So much pressure even being placed upon them, even during the scamdemic or the pandemic. 
They was crying and fussing and complaining. We can't put on any shows. We can't perform. We can't go on tour. What are we supposed to do? How are we going to make a living? What are we going to do? Where are we going to party? Things got so bad for them. They were, on, they were online, determined to party. They, I mean, seriously, Emma, they were online hosting virtual parties. I'll never forget. Uh, what's, the, what's the name? D-Nice. Used to be with KRS One and all of them from the Boogie Down Bronx Productions, some Boogie Down Product. They they online holding a, hosting a virtual party. All he doing just online scratching records and people tuning in live to his Instagram. Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, and others all on the live. They tipping them money and everything, and then suddenly they say he raised one hundred fifty thousand dollars in the house though. Prior to that, just in the house, everybody sad, everybody bored, scared, quarantined, can't go out, worried about the stress of the world and all of the new diseases and the new variants of COVID, could get variants. COVID ran through, what, two, three different alphabets with all of the variants? I know they, ran, they had a variant for every letter in the Greek alphabet, from alpha to gamma to delta and so many other variants where it's like, okay, all right, y'all done ran out of the Greek alphabet. So what letter, you, what language you jumping into now? What are we going to do? English? We're going to do Latin? Are you going to get into Hebrew with the next round of variants? What you doing? So much was going on. But the merry hearted, they sighed. They was upset. Couldn't host their ball games. Couldn't go to their concerts. White folks in the middle of the country, they were upset. Damn it, open the movie theaters. We want to go get massages. We want to watch movies. Bah, 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 bah. And they started shooting and storming the Capitol. They kidnapped government officials and threats and everything was made. They were upset. They were pissed off. But yet this is the stuff that the wicked engineered and they wasn't factoring in these types of things going on. They telling everybody to go into the house. What's the boy name that, um, that took over the wildlife preserve? Um, Ammon Bundy. You, you can Google him later. Him and his father. They were some, I guess you could call them, I'm trying to think of the term that they refer to themselves, but they pro Second Amendment. They, they real uh, right wing conservative Christians. They heavy into their guns and everything. And they just determined, no, you're not going to tell us what to do. Gatherings of 10 or more. I forgot where they went, but they went from one state to another on Easter Sunday and held a service of about 2,000 some odd white boys, just them and their guns on Easter Sunday, just determined. They in utter defiance of the government. So these are the types of things that they wasn't factoring in when they came up with all of these things to inconvenience and make life harder for the people. The mirth of tabrets ceases. The noise of them that rejoice ends. The joy of the harp ceases. You thought that was something. Just wait until real tribulation hit when all them concerts and them stadiums is empty. They closed them football games and all of that nonsense, the fanfare, them Taylor Swift and Beyonce concerts and all of that stuff, when all of that's brought to a halt and there's no more. The joy of the harp ceases, the entertainment industry, all of this stuff knocked out, knocked the bottom of it out. And they shall not drink wine with the song and strong drink shall be bitter to them that drink it. So they'll end up living their own real life version of that Gil Scott Heron song, The Bottle. Gil Scott Heron had a song called The Bottle and he just sang about a couple of different people in their lives and their stories of what they went through that led them to alcoholism. And the song started off with the story of a little black boy just running scared because his father was a drunk. His father quit his job, started drinking, took his mother's wedding ring, pawned it, sold that so he could get a bottle. There was a sister in the song. She turned to alcoholism because her old, her boyfriend killed somebody. He ended up going to jail. The preacher talking to her one day, trying to get her off the bottle. She take the bottle, hit him over the head with it. it. It was a wild and crazy little song, but the song just centered around alcoholism and what it does to people's lives. And these people, they look up, in the tribulation, they'll have their own real life version of it. it. Talks about how they won't drink wine with a song, won't be no more of that, like the brothers used to do in the 60s and the 70s, getting drunk with the Thunderbird or the Wild Irish Rose. Ooh, 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 ooh. Be none of that. There won't be no singing and no do out for nothing. Everybody be upset, sad, troubled, hard times all around for everybody. And the strong drink shall be bitter to them to drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. 
Baltimore has well used to be sixteen thousand some odd houses that were boarded up, but a great majority of them now have been knocked down in vacant lots now in the land just lying desolate, just like the scripture says. And that's in Baltimore. And that's going on in all the major cities. You can see the same pattern in places like Philadelphia, Detroit, Los Angeles, so many other places throughout the country with them vacant houses just being torn down. Those that aren't torn down, they still stand boarded up so that the people can't get in. And the ones that aren't boarded up, they come along and they put metal and they put shields and plates all over it, welded the doors and the windows shut so that no man can enter. Stuff right here in the scripture. There's crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened, and the mirth of the land is gone. In the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. Look at America's gate. The one Donald Trump fighting so adamantly to protect and keep all those quote-unquote illegals from coming into, coming across America's border every day by the hundreds of thousands every day but yet so many people rallied for it come on get in there no person is illegal come on we give them sanctuary cities they can go here and seek refuge they can go there and seek refuge but the very people in those cities that look like you and me that need just a little bit of help you get doors slammed in your face you starving struggling you got a job in some instances people might have two or three barely making it Fighting to maintain the car, the insurance that goes with it, the house, the shelter, all of the amenities that the children need, putting food in the refrigerator, and trying to find time to be a parent to all the children and get some rest in between the jobs. And you're just looking for a little bit of relief, but you get none of it. But yet, Jorge and Javier and Esmeralda and Marguerite, they come over the border, especially when they get to New York. If they can make it to New York, they get up there. They got hotels and all sorts of free accommodations. One hotel in particular, the row, they give them laundry service. They give them monetary stipends. They get health insurance and all sorts of stuff. And they go on off. Some of the parents leave the children in the room for days. They get fed multiple times a day. People come pick up their laundry and everything. And you live here. And you live here, and you can't get nothing but a hard way to go. And this is what's happening. And then they go up on everything for you, and all the money that they're extracting from you is going over here to them. See, this is what's happening, but they don't see, though, this is going to be their downfall also. The scripture even talks about that as well. And this ain't to turn nobody against the Latino community or anything, but we just highlighting what's really happening. We just highlighting what's going on. But when we came here, our, our existence was illegal when you brought us here, just bringing us off the boat. Just us doing anything that was outside of wearing them chains and shackles and picking that cotton and bending over and busting it open whenever Massa told us to, doing anything other than that was simply illegal. Then they come on along. They even had medical and clinical terms for when you decided you no longer wanted to work. Imagine that. You being whipped. You being beat. You being raped. You being made to work against your will. They ain't paying you nothing. And then you decide, you know what, I don't like this. First chance I get, I'm out. Then they catch you. This nigger is crazy. This nigger has a mental disorder. This nigger suffers from drapetomania. Yes, that's it. We're, that's the disease. Yep, we're, we're making it up on the spot. Yep, this nigger here suffers from drapetomania. This nigger's crazy. He wants to be free. This nigger will no longer be subject to our institutionalized racism. He wants to escape, and he wants to fight, and he wants to be free. All we want him to do is put those chains on, go back to working in that field, and everything will be fine. But he doesn't want to. He's out of his mind. Don't be like him. And these are the types of things that they did to us. But yet, it wasn't no laundry service for us. You barely wanted to give us clothes. We read the writings of people like Frederick Douglass. We read the novel. It wasn't even a novel. It was a biography. The Life in the Slave. A day, 
the life in the day of a slave, Harriet Jacobs. We read them now, we read them works where those people sat back and they explained how they may have gotten three pair of pants over the course of a year. They may have gotten three shirts over the course of a year. Some that were fortunate may have gotten one pair of shoes and they had to make those shoes last all year. And those who had fortunate owners or kind owners gave them another pair of shoes each year on Christmas. We read that stuff, but yet, fast forward several hundred years, you give us nothing but a hard way to go, and you tell us to forget about everything. You better not mention the word reparation. Uh-uh, no, mm-mm, you are trouble. They give you nothing, but then they let these other folks come on in and give them everything. You don't have a job? We have seven you can choose from. They're all low-wage jobs. They're all low-paying, Jorge, but there's seven of them. You can have two or three of them if you like. You don't have health insurance, Jorge? Hey, look, you want Kaiser? You want Affleck? You want Aetna? Which one? Pick. You know how to use a washing machine? Cool. You take your clothes off, and we'll come, and we'll do it for you. That's what's happening. That's how they being treated. But yet at the same time, None of that stuff is cheap. None of that stuff is free. All of that stuff costs. Somebody's paying for it. And after so long of a time, like any depository or like any hoard of cash, eventually it runs out. And America is at that point in time now where funds is running real low. But yet, let's go in here to Jeremiah. And we were talking about those, quote unquote, what they call today illegals. See what the scripture had to say about America or Babylon concerning these same group of people. And we're going here into Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah 51, 12 says, set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. For Yahweh has both devised and done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. So Yahweh's calling this thing America's fall. Yahweh's putting it in motion. It's, it's equivalent to a mafia boss calling in a hit. It's equivalent to a military general ordering a strike. For Yahweh has both devised and done that which he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. O you that dwell upon many waters, abundant in treasures, your end is come and the measure of your covetousness. Yahweh has sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill you with men as with caterpillars, and they shall lift up a shout against you. Then we go backwards in the same book. We go backwards to Jeremiah chapter 50. We start reading about the fall of Babylon, how those same men, they're coming in across the borders. I came told us, I think it was last week or the week before, upwards of 300 and some thousand of them came across the border in a single day. But yet, they talking about you and I. We, what we asking for too, too much. The inflation, we just want the prices to come down just so we can be able to live comfortably. But yet at the same time, we get squeezed, we get inconvenienced, everything is shook up and everything is turned upside down for us. The pressure is applied to us, but at the same time, there's no way in the world you're going to apply all that pressure to us as Yahweh's people and not feel to squeeze yourselves as the wicked. Go back here to Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 13 says, Because of the wrath of Yahweh, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goes by Babylon shall be astonished and shall hiss at her plagues. Put yourselves in array against Babylon round about. All you that bend the bow, it's the military men now, these, this, your, these your shooters, these your hitters, shoot at her and spare no arrows, for she has sinned against Yahweh. Shout against her round about. She has given her hand, her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down, for it is the vengeance of Yahweh. Take vengeance upon her, as she has done, do unto her. So now look at it. Now they done robbed you, they done exploited you, they done cheated you in every way, shape, and form. They done misused you, they done mistreated you and abused you. And now look at this, they new inhabitants or the illegals, they coming in, they doing the same thing to her now. They taking advantage of her now. They working her. They talk about us. So the black woman, the black man, you know, they're, they're welfare kings and welfare queens. They frauds. They milking the system. But then you got a whole new class of people coming in now. You think you're going to use them to inconvenience everybody else because you figured you get them in. It's much cheaper labor. 
But then in turn, they coming in, they milking you, they getting over on you too, they burning you up, they wearing you out, they tearing you up, they coming in, you talk about us with children, they coming in, you think they ain't laying around humping one another and producing more and more babies too? Come on, come on now. And you think them babies ain't learning how the game goes and how to play it too? Yeah, they pile up in the houses, they pool their resources and everything together, but yet at the same time, you think they ain't coming in? You, you think all of them gonna come in and be law-abiding citizens? And if you do think that, explain to me MS-13 and the Latin Kings and all the other gangs that's in all of the major inner cities of America terrorizing folks. Come on, explain all of this stuff to me. But yet, this is a result. You, as Richard Pryor said in the joke, said the white man was going to get him some new niggas. He said the ones that they had here, they wasn't acting right. The, 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 the current niggas, they was getting too rowdy. They was protesting. They was wanting freedom and justice. They was wanting equality and all that other stuff. But he said the white man was going to get him some new niggas. And the new niggas came in in the form of the Mexicans. The new niggas came in in the form of the El Salvadorans. The new niggas came in in the form of the Guatemalans and the Puerto Ricans and the Dominicans. The new niggas came in, they wasn't protesting. They didn't want $15 and $17 an hour. The new niggas was coming in, they was going to do the work of the old niggas for $10.75 and $11.30. They was coming in, they was going to work. They was going to do, 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 you have a job? $10, I work. But the position might have required somebody else that was more skilled to be paid $24.50. So in turn, he, he taking a $14.50 loss. He just want the job. So in turn, they coming on in, and then they come on in. Certain stuff they ain't doing is supposed to be doing, and they coming in, they bringing others in, and the others coming in. They got their little gang activity. They got their levels of crime and drugs as well, but they don't broadcast it as much on the nightly news as they do Dontrell and Man Man and them Bloods and them Crips and them Vice Lords and them Black Disciples and them Gangster Disciples in Chicago and other places. Now, they broadcast all of our sin and our iniquity when our young brothers and sisters form their little gangs and stuff. They throw all of that on the news every night. That starts the news and it ends the news. But yet, when they coming in, when the new niggas is coming in, you don't hear much about it until the victims are white people. Then suddenly, when Javier grabs Angel and chokes her to death, or when Jorge grabs Susan and rapes Susan and takes her car, then suddenly you hear, it's a problem, this, this, this is ridiculous, you know, that, that Biden they need to close the borders, it's, it's a travesty, what's happening to our country? We gotta get things back right, that's why we need Trump in there, you know, we gotta get the borders and protect them, because this wouldn't happen if you voted for Trump. You, that, that's how they do it. Now, as long as Jorge is jacking up Maisha, or if Jorge and Javier rob Malik, it's all fine. It's sweep it under the rug. It's, it's just typical, typical, typical nigger problems, you know. But as soon as it spills over and it's Karen and Ashley and Molly being robbed and raped and shot down, then suddenly we need to do something about this. This is a national epidemic. Same thing with the drugs. Then when it was crack. When it was our aunts and it was our uncles and they were stealing our TVs and pawning our Sega Genesis and all that stuff to buy crack cocaine and heroin, they didn't care. But then suddenly, now that it's Todd that's dying and overdosing on fentanyl, it's a nationwide epidemic. Susan is overdosed on fentanyl. Something needs to be done about this. We need to have legislation. We need to crack down on these drug dealers, especially those that are dealing fentanyl. But nobody ever asked the question, who the hell is placing an elephant tranquilizer in the hands of these folks in these inner cities? The people who are dealing it, many of them don't even know what the hell it is. It's an elephant tranquilizer. But yet nobody's asking, Okay, well, where's it coming from? Who's providing it? And the same thing, they looked at, now they looked at black folks crazy when it was crack cocaine in the 80s, and the same questions was raised, and people were asking, well, how's it getting in the country when most of the dealers can barely find the countries on the map that produce it? Most of the dealers, 
didn't have passports, couldn't tell you what a passport was. Only only passport they knew about was the Honda passport, the little vehicle. But outside of that, they, they didn't have no passports to leave the country, to go to Bolivia and Panama and other places to get the cocaine. But yet the cocaine was mysteriously making its way to Chicago, Detroit, Compton, Los Angeles, Houston, Detroit, Baltimore, and other places. The cocaine was popping up there. But yet it's now same thing with the fentanyl. It's making its way into all of the major cities of America. And it was all fine and dandy as long as Man Man and Maisha and Malik were dying from it. But as soon as Todd and Ashley and Helen were dying, well, it's a nationwide epidemic. Something needs to be done about this. This is terrible. This is horrific. America is being torn apart at the seams. Mm, yeah. uh, what's that, Narcan? Yeah, now they want folks to carry the Narcan around. Yeah, and... And they didn't put the stipulation in place now. If you're in the proximity of somebody that overdoses and you there with them and you happen to be using, if you help them, they help you avoid prosecution. Yeah. But yet this is the type of stuff that's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you help them during their overdose, you could be right there with them. Getting ready to use. You could be right there with them. But if they get a little more of it than you, Emma, and you mad to him, why you got to take all of it? And they, and they dying or in the process of dying and you trying to help and you just explain to them, no, 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 I, uh, no, I was trying to help. I was trying to revive them. Okay, all right, okay, cool. Gee, you know, we won't lock you up, this, that, and the other, you know, even though you were in possession of it, you know, but you were trying to help somebody who was getting ready to die from it, but you know what we'll do? Okay, we'll check you in the treatment. We'll check you in the rehab, okay? Wasn't none of that, com wasn't none of that compassion in the 80s. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, and and yep, they sure are. They still upset. They they still get, yeah, they still get upset about it. Yeah, don't. No, mm. If they on the verge of dying, you better not blow that high. That's what they call it. it blew my high. Nigga, bring me back. Messing it up, man. A waste of good money right there. They still get upset behind that. But you brought all of these different things in. Just give it to the niggas. Get get get, get rid of them. But yet at the same time, you ain't gonna do nothing to us, and y'all are not allowed to blow back into your own homes. Scripture even says it for the smart Alex that might be watching or looking or listening and just eh, eh, don't say nothing about that. No ain't word ain't say nothing about that. Or to Christians that's online that then found the channel and that somehow, some way, hear me preach in the name of Yahweh and Yahshua all evening and still think they listening to God's folks that's going, oh, that ain't in God's word. He didn't say nothing like that. I'm going to show you. Yahweh said to the children of Israel, them that oppress you, I will feed them with their own flesh. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 25. But thus saith Yahweh, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. So you ain't going to run, America ain't going to run with their prison industry complex forever. You ain't going to have that phenomenon of mass incarceration forever. You're not going to have the school to prison pipeline forever where you sitting back monitoring the third and fourth grade reading and test scores of young black boys and using that as criteria to determine how many jails you need to build in the future for how many of these niggas over here in third and fourth grade goofing off at lunch you need to lock up 20 years from now. You ain't going to have that forever. Now we said plain, I'm going to read it again. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contends with you, and I will save your children. That's what Gil Scott Heron and the intruders were telling the people to do anyway. He was telling, save the children. That's what they were singing about. Told the people, save the children. Said the babies play such a small part of the things that one day they'll soon be at the heart of. But Yahweh say he will save your children. And in conjunction with saving your children, to go on even further, after saving the babies, Yahweh said, I will feed them that oppress you with their own flesh. So you create this nonsense to kill us as a people. But then you think your own children ain't looking, oh, wow, damn. 
that crack. They look like they're having a really good time smoking that crack. Oh, wow, they're shooting heroin. They look like they're having a ball. Let's go over there. Let's, let's go to the ghetto. Come on, let's take a ride. You know, they don't have that out here in Hanover. You know, we don't get that in Milford Mill. We don't get that in Pikesville. So let's go on to East Baltimore. Let's go down the hill. Let's go to Eager and Monford. Yeah, let's see what they're selling. If they're busy, you know, we can always go to Pennsylvania North and West Baltimore. Yeah, they have it good. Let's go there. Let's go get the good stuff. That's where it is. You know, go down here. Let's go to Sandtown. You know, they have something here called DOA. People have died from that dope. We, that's good. We, we, we got to go there and get that. GPS, so and so and so. That's how they do. They get to using the drug, the narcotics to kill folks. Once the word gets out that somebody overdosed and died, that's where all the fiends and the addicts go and grab it. Oh, they got that killer dope. They died from that. Oh, yeah, we need two bags of that. But yet, Yahweh said, I will feed them that oppress you with their own flesh. They brought that stuff into the country intentionally to wipe out us, but in turn, it spilled into their own households. And they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. See, see, Yahweh know how to pay back, even down to the point where with the issues such as police brutality, the killings of unarmed black men and black women and children by police. Yeah, there was instances where they was even killing their own. You ain't got to believe me. You go look up the murder of Tony Temper down in Dallas, Texas. 32-year-old white man. He called the police because he having a mental breakdown. He called the police for help because he's going through something. Police get there, hit him with the George Floyd before George Floyd had even passed away. Yep. You got to believe me. Look him up. Tony Temper, T-I-M-P-A. You can look his story up. He gets there. Police get there. They laying them down. They raking them out. Then it turns into an altercation, which they love. Then they turn. They arrest him. They put him down. Man put all his body weight on his neck. Held him down for about 14 minutes. He died. What's the other one? I forget, I forget the little dude's name. He was half black, half white. But his mother was white. Police killed him. They were up in arms about that. Like, oh, okay, now it's an issue. Now, now them white mothers is crying. But where was all of the sympathy for Sabrina Fulton when they killed Trayvon Martin? Where was the sympathy for Mike Brown's mother? Where was the sympathy for little seven-year-old Ayanna Stanley Jones in Detroit who was just laying down, sleep on her grandmother's couch when the police come in to do a house raid at the wrong address and shot the baby to death in her sleep? Wasn't no sympathy for her family. And they just kept on going until the next police killing went on. And they got us so numb to it the way after so long of a time, the hashtag for this one, hashtag for that one, justice for so-and-so, justice for such and such, justice for this one. Say her name, say his name, say their name. They had everybody sounding like Beyonce and them from Destiny's Child after so long of a time. The police killings were just going on and on and on for so long. We got numb to it. But then in turn, when it started hitting them white folks, when their mothers started crying, when Susan and Kelly and Deborah and Ashley started having to wipe their eyes because their babies were being martyred, suddenly it was a problem. But Yahweh said it. He said, I will feed them and oppress you with their own flesh. Talk about dog eat dog. And they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, Yahweh, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of your Jacob. See, so they ain't going to be able to apply the pressure to us and not feel the squeeze themselves. Yahweh ain't playing with nobody in this earth. Everybody's going to catch it. But the thing is, to minimize the punishment and the retribution that you got coming from Yahweh, get right with him. Do his will. Do his commandments. Drop whatever wickedness you and I may have. Let it all go now while we had a chance. Before the judgment and the suffering starts, crowd unto him now, night and day. Beg of him for forgiveness and repentance and seek him. Crowd unto him night and day because he ain't playing with none of us. He will tear the fur off this whole world. And the one thing you want, you want to be right with him so as to receive his mercy and his favor. But in the end, of course, you know, there'll be folks that'll just think light of it. They'll take it as a game until the judgment smacks them square in their damn face. Then they'll look back and then they'll reflect on things and, oh man, what is it? But by that point, it'll be entirely too late. 
when the famine start, when the food shortages hit, when the temples get closed, when the power grids fail, when the electricity is cut off, when the predators roam the streets, or as they say, when the barbarians are at the gate, when the doors are being kicked in, when the ravaging, the raping, and the pillaging begins to start, and then suddenly, people, oh, Yahweh, please help, help, help. No, uh-uh, too late now. No, ain't no need to cry out for help now. You had plenty of time to do that. Had plenty of time to get ready. Had plenty of time to get your soul and your life in order but nah you took it as a joke you kept playing took it lightly so in turn Yahweh turns up the heat on the wicked as they seek to turn up the heat on us but at the same time with the tribulation going on it's coming our way Israel let us keep one factor forever in our mind from now until Yahshua comes some of the greatest miracles that Yahweh did for Israel was done for us as a nation when we were under some of the greatest levels of pressure and stress. Don't believe me? Go back, check Yahweh's word. The miracles that was done in Egypt, Israel was catching hell down in ancient Egypt when Yahweh brought them out for the Passover. But yet at the same time, as miraculous as it was, imagine that you being beat and somebody tell you, you got a certain quota of brick that you got to lay every day. And on top of laying that quota, or meeting that quota, them brick you got to lay, you got to make the brick as well and stay on par with the quota or else they come take your baby and lay your baby in the wall and lay out the rest of the structure on top of your baby. You tell me that wasn't hell? And that's what the Egyptians were doing to Israel prior to Yahweh, bringing Israel out of ancient Egypt. But then in turn, Yahweh struck at the 10 most powerful gods in Egypt at that time, smote the nation, struck them all, turned the water to blood, struck them with flies, lice, plagued them with darkness, struck the firstborn, killed all the males throughout all the land of Egypt among man and beast. And then in the midst of that, he brought his people out of the land. And when they got to the water, Yahweh parted the Red Sea and made the Red Sea stand, made the waters part so that they could leave on dry land. You think Yahweh ain't going to do the same thing for Israel under this immense pressure that we under now? But the thing about it, we got to continue to, we got to remember these things. We got to remember these miracles that Yahweh did for us as a people. The book of Hebrews talks about us as a people being compassed with such a great cloud of witnesses. Just like families had their photo albums to where they look back periodically and they, oh, yeah, hey, man, look. Look at Uncle Hurl, this, that, and the other. This when he was skinny and when he had hair. This, that, and the, oh, man, look at great-grandmama so-and-so-and-so. Oh, wow, look at such-and-such such on her lap as a baby. Oh, man, yeah, hey, this was that time when they lived at such-and-such such a house. And families go back through their photo albums and they look at their history. This your photo album, Israel. All these great patriarchs and matriarchs of old, all these miraculous things that Yahweh did for Israel as a people. You feel downtrodden. You feel like you oppressed. You feel like you ain't coming out of the trial or the tribulation you in. You got too many examples of Yahweh bringing other Israelites through their trials and through their tribulations who also felt like, oh, man, this is it. Yahweh, Yahweh please help me. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Man. But then Yahweh brought them out. And the scripture tells us that Yahweh is the same. He changes not. Therefore, you sons of your cob are not consumed. So just as Yahweh moved on the behalf of Joseph when he was down in jail, falsely accused, locked up, locked away, doing a bit for something he didn't even do, Yahweh delivered Joseph from the jail, brought him up out of it. David, fleeing for his life. Yahweh's anointed, slated to be king, but the current king at the time hated him and despised him because he knew, oh man, I'm, I'm messing up. And that, he, man, you know, I, I got to kill him before he even get the slot. It's no different than the person being fired from a job. You pick your employment and whatever the office profession is, you can imagine. But imagine a person being replaced or being fired, but before they let them go, they make them train their replacement. I seen a brother one time years ago on the job. He had to do that. He flipped out. Rather than train his replacement, he took everything out of the office. Even the company computer took the chair out from under the desk. Rather than train the brother that was going to be in there to replace him when he was gone. Took everything. And the janitor, hey, man, that, hey, that, hey, hey, that ain't your... 
Like, shut up. So the brother figured, you ain't work here no more, so hey, I, I can tell on you. So the brother figured, I'll get you in trouble. I tell the white man on you. So the janitor just, man, that ain't yours. Man, where you going with that computer? Where you going with that computer? And he just kept trying to get the brother in trouble so that the white superintendent could come in and see him putting the computer in his car. But by that point, black brother had then took everything, even the company computer, put it in his back trunk of his little Jaguar, went on, took the last couple items from his desk and left the brother that was going to be replacing him, just left him there looking stupid. Yep. And that's what Shaul was doing with King David. He, he hated him, couldn't stand him. But yet, Yahweh at the same time delivered Dawid, spared him from every attempt on his life, and then raised him up to be king in his stead. You think Yahweh won't raise you up over all your trials and all your tribulations, those people that hate you and they persecuting you, all these different trials and afflictions that's coming upon you, me, and all of Israel collectively? Don't think for one minute that Yahweh is not able to raise us up from all of these trials and these tribulations. The same way brothers in the street, their whole grudges, their whole beefs and things like that, Brother feel like he got slighted, whether it's in a drug deal, a dice game, or any other transaction. If a brother feel like he got slighted or done wrong, he'll hold that grudge. He might not say nothing about it today. He might let it ride this year. But then the person who done him wrong, out of the blue, you look up, three, four years later, that person then got gunned down, just seemingly for no reason at all. Brother holding that grudge from half a decade ago. I'm going to get that nigga. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to let it ride. I'm, I'm going to let it ride. And the same way brothers will do that to one another, they hold them grudges and they hold them beefs and they remember that stuff where they felt like they was mistreated. We got to do the same thing with the miraculous things that Yahweh has done for us. We got to hold on to that stuff. If you prayed and you cried out to Yahweh one time during what you thought was the greatest trial of your life and Yahweh delivered you from it and you got out of it and you got your request granted for whatever you prayed for, you got to hold on to that. You got to lock that in. Just like the brother who's vindictive and holding the grudge, you got to hold on to that. You, all right, Yahweh moved for me in this. Yahweh did that for me. Yahweh did such and such a thing for me. All right, if I keep living right, Yahweh will bring me through this too. I, I can't forget him now because the pressure on, the pressure tight, is difficult. I can't forget him. I can't afford to forget him now. All the stuff he did for me back then, nah, he going to come through. He just ain't coming through yet. I just got to continue to persevere. I just got to continue to hold on till he do come through. It's like waiting on a person that told you they was coming at a specified time, but they might be held up in traffic. They may have originally got there to you and been early, but because they got into an accident or they may have ran into an accident, and you know how it is on the highway, the accident over here, everybody else bottlenecking, everybody else rubbernecking, so the road bottlenecks. So the person would have originally been there 15 minutes early, but they stuck in traffic waiting. They still coming. They going to be there. They just not going to be there at that time that you thought they was coming. That would be the same way. You looking for them to move right now. Yahweh might want to test your faith. As minister told us last week, Yahweh will test your loyalty. Yahweh might be testing you just to see how faithful you're going to be, how steadfast you're going to remain in your prayer. Are you going to stop praying because it didn't happen right away? Or are you going to continue to pray until what you ask for is granted? Well, let's go on in here into the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 105. Let's go to Psalm 105. 105.12. <clears throat> now this is talking about all the things that Yahweh did for Israel early in their history when Israel was beginning to become a nation. He was beginning to move for them and show them the miraculous things that he was going to do for them throughout the earth. When they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yeah, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. You think Yahweh don't feel the same way about you today? You think Yahweh don't feel that exact same way about you as his people, as his anointed? The same way in which Yahweh smacked Abimelech down for lusting after Abraham's wife. The same way in which Yahweh knocked him on his duff every time he tried to approach Mother Sarah. Yahweh knocked him down to the point where he realized, oh, oh, hey, 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 man, look, this is not your sister. This is your wife. And you know what? You take her. You get away from me. The same way in which Yahweh moved against Pharaoh on the behalf of ancient Israel. You think Yahweh ain't capable of moving against your adversaries today? Whether they be at, at, whether they be sitting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or whether they sitting 
three cubicles down the hall from you, giving you blues, giving you trouble. Think y'all ain't able to move on your same behalf today? Mm -mm. If you think he ain't able to move on your behalf, you better perish that thought and get closer to him and get to know him so that he will move on your behalf. But it says plainly, touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. Yahweh ain't playing about those who he love. Let's go back here to Isaiah chapter 3. Let's go to Isaiah 3.10. Say ye to the righteous that it should be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. So if you're striving to live right, no matter what persecution or tribulation coming down the pike, you be all right. You're going to be all right. You're going to go through some things. You're going to go through some suffering, some embarrassment, some humiliation. But on the other side of that, you have deliverance, you have redemption, you have salvation. But you just have to endure the humiliation and embarrassment. But woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given unto him. So they fighting you now to make life difficult for you. They fighting to make life a living hell for you on every front. And they're going to continue with this fight and this assault for as long as Yahweh allows them to. But yet at the same time, in the midst of them fighting to make life that much harder for you, they only making it that much harder for themselves. It's like imagine a person trying to set you on fire. A person trying to choke you to death. But in order for the person to choke you, they got to actually get up on you. They got to actually engage you. They got to get in your proximity. So they attempting to choke you. You got a chance to fight. You got a chance to do one or two things. While they coming to choke you and try to wring your neck, you got the opportunity to either move in some way, shape, or form to deflect them choking you and you can flee or depending on how you feeling, you got the opportunity to, instead of running, you can take it to them and tear the fur off of them and let them know what it's like to be choked and gasp for air and wonder whether or not this going to be their last breath. So just as they applying pressure to you, just as they tightening the noose around your neck and they getting ready to heat up the furnace at the same time, they too going to gasp for air. They too going to feel the heat as well. Book of Proverbs asks the question, can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? So hey, ain't no way in the world y'all was going to allow these people to mistreat his people for so long without feeling it themselves. Now let's go on here real quick. I have one point I want to make. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Get there real quick. You go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Bear with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bear with me for one second, y'all. I was looking at something in Isaiah. I'm going to go back here to Daniel chapter 3. And you keep this point in mind here. Daniel 3 verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Now you pay attention to what we read in this third chapter of Daniel, because this third chapter of Daniel is very pertinent to what Israel is going to go through in the not too distant future concerning a particular beast and their image and somebody wanting everybody to bow and bend and worship. This particular image is going to emerge in the latter days. But pay attention to this group of people. Pay attention to Yahweh's servants and what happens to them. Now, he got all of these people. And Nebuchadnezzar called everybody. Princes, governors, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs called everybody to worship before this thing. He wanted everybody to be there. Look at this, y'all. I built this image. Built this in the image of me. Come see it. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces, they were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So you're letting the people know now, whenever you hear a particular tune or this type of music played, get down to your knees. Bow, worship this. 
And whosoever falls not and worships the same hour, he shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. See, now they're setting the stage now for anybody that's in non-compliance. Anybody that's not operating according to this decree. And therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down, and they worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near, and they accused the Yahudim, or the Hebrews. See, now people snitching. Now, didn't Yahshua say earlier that they would come and they would accuse you and they would cause people to put hands on you and they would persecute you and cause you to be brought before kings? Now, these people coming in, they snitching now. The Chaldeans, and they spoke and they said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou king, you made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the sackbut, the cornet, the flute, the harp, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship your image. And whosoever falls not down and worship that image, he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain people of the Yahudim or those of Judah who you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these the Babylonian names that was given. They were treated just like our ancestors, taken from their original homeland, brought to somebody else's province, had their real names taken from them, and had these names, or as the brothers and sisters say today, these were their government names. These were the names of their slave masters. But their true names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But they refer to them as Shadrach and Meshach, which means, I believe Shadrach is a who will deliver Meshach was property of Aku, and Abednego was a servant of Nego. But all of their names, the, the Babylonian names they were given, were names in honor of different gods that they were worshiping. But yet, they had Hebrew names that spoke of their true relationship with Almighty Yahweh. But yet, they were stripped of their own names and referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, they've not regarded you. They serve not your gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you set up. See, now they snitching on them. Just, hey, man, you said for everybody to worship. You said for everybody to bow down at the time that you blow that horn and make that sound. They over there, they ain't bowed, they ain't been, and you got them in positions of authority. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he looked in his image, and he, he was enraged, and fury commanded to bring Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke and he said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I set up? Now he's going to ask them now. The people have already dimed them out. Now he's going to tell them this is the last chance. He can trip them up. Look, y'all ain't worshiping the gods we serving. Y'all ain't bow before my image. What's up? Let, let me know. Is this true? Now it goes on further, says, Now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, and all kinds of music, if you fall down and you worship the image which I've made, well, but if you worship not, you should be cast that same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who's the God? Or who's the Elohim that shall deliver you out of my hands? So now he's letting them know, hey, look, y'all got the next time that you hear them instruments. The next time them instruments sound, y'all better be on y'all knees. Otherwise, y'all going to be in that furnace that same hour. Who going to deliver you from this? So Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they answered and they said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. So now we're, hey man, look, as the young people say, we're going to keep it all the way real. We're going to keep it a buck. Ain't nobody care about your feelings. Yeah, we ain't bow down before your image. No, we did not bow down before. And we are not going to bow down before it. Letting them be known. If it be so, our Elohim, who we serve, he is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he'll deliver us out of your hand, O king. And that's serious. And that takes some heart. Now, this is not only the king, but this is the man here, if you will. He's their boss to a degree. He put them up in positions to handle certain affairs in the province. And then somebody tells them, hey, man, look, they ain't working. It would be the equivalent today 
imagine you on your job, you and two other Hebrews, you're all on your job or what have you, and they might want you to salute the flag at a certain time. Hey, man, they ain't get up. They ain't got their hand over their heart. They didn't get up out their seat. They ain't say the Pledge of Allegiance, man. Look, something wrong with them. So now the folks, they done sick the king on them. And now they trying to make sure that they get prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So then the Hebrews let them know, hey, look, we don't care how you feel. We're not mindful of what we say to you. No, Yahweh able to deliver us from whatever punishment you got for us. And he's able to deliver us from your hand. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, it made him mad now, so much so to the point where he ain't even looking at him the same no more. He's angry now. He pissed off with him. So then he goes on further. His visage was changed against all of them, and therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And that's serious. Now, they got a specified temperature in which they usually heat the furnace, but he going to give the demand, no, you know what? Crank the heat up seven times hotter than what it usually is. And imagine your oven or your stove, the highest your oven might go. Let's say if you got an oven that goes up to 500 degrees, but then somebody decides, you know what? No, nah, since we're going to throw so-and-so in the oven, uh-uh, no, nah, crank that bad boy up to 3,500. Get it up there. High as you can get. Make it seven times hotter than what it normally is. Now this man was enraged because they would not worship his image. You think Shatan's children in the latter days during the time of the mark of the beast, you think their, heat, their anger ain't going to enrage to the same degree when they look up and realize that there's a people on the planet that have not accepted the mark of the beast, that there's a people on the planet that are functioning outside of the cashless society, that there are people on the planet that are flourishing and do not have the mark, have not bent or bowed before the image of the beast and are still alive and present in the earth at the time that Yahweh allows his judgment and those bowls of wrath to be poured upon the earth, you think they ain't going to enrage? Especially when they get to that one plague where that foul and painful, grievous sore falls upon them that have the mark, and then they get to going through and they got all kinds of medical complications because the thing they done injected in their right hand or in their forehead then malfunctioned on them. And now the little thing that bursts and all the carcinogens and the poison is now inside of their body and they catching hell physiologically. And then they in turn look, this is because of you. You ain't got the mark. Y'all ain't got the mark. This is falling upon all of us because of you. You won't participate. And then suddenly the people's sentiments rise up against you. Don't think for one minute that it ain't going to happen. So then he goes on further. After having he, having the command to heat up the oven, he commanded the most mighty men in his army to bind Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and to cast them into the burning furnace. You get your best to go and apprehend them. And then these men, they were bound in their coats with their hose and, and their hats and all their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. But therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the fire was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And can you imagine that? People commanded to take you. The king goes and get his mightiest soldiers. He go get his hardest hitters. He go get his best to bind you, to grab you, to lock you up and arrest you. Imagine being locked up by the chief of police personally. He come and grab you and take you to jail. But then... The fire was so hot, they throw you in the furnace. But then the flames overtake the ones that threw you in the furnace. How about that? They die. Now they managed to visualize this. As I read it, as I read it, visualize it. He didn't turn the heat up on the furnace. It's seven times hotter than what they usually crank it up to. Then these men, they come and get you. They ball you up. You got all your clothes and everything. They tie you up. You handcuffed and shackled. You bound. And they throw you in. But then in turn, the flames bypass you. Whoosh, reach out and kill the very ones that threw you in. Tell me Yahweh ain't working in this. And it goes on and says, And the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And these three men, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah, they fell down, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up in great haste, and he spoke and said unto his counselors, 
Didn't we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And this should go to show all government employees just how insignificant you are in the scheme of things today. This ought to let all government employees know they do not give a damn about you. They showed you that during the midst of the crisis of 2019 onward. They had certain employees, the sacrificials, I'm sorry, the essential employees. You know, they had the narrative on the news. It's, it's a crisis outside. If you go outside, it gets on your clothes. It could kill you. You could die. It's, it's in the air. It's everywhere. You can't escape it. You can't duck it. It's everywhere. Put on two masks. In fact, put on four masks. Put on gloves. Take a bath and hand sanitizer. It can get you. It can kill you. Make sure you shower in Lysol and bleach because it could get on you. It could kill you. But we need you to come back to Walmart. We need you to stock these shelves. You with that RN beside your name, we need you in this house. Hospital, you with that CNA, the GN, we need you all in the hospital. Come on back. You all are essential employees. Yes, it could kill you, but at the same time, come on back to work. We need you in here. You're essential. No, what they really meant to say, you were sacrificial. We really don't give a damn about you, but we need you in here. And if you die in the process, well, hey, oh well, come on in and get the job done. So this right here ought to show all the government employees they don't think anything about you. Nebuchadnezzar's first thing, never mind the fact that the flames overtook his best soldiers. He ain't even asked about that. Hey, look, didn't we throw three of them in there? Never even asked what happened to the soldiers. No inquiry into their well-being or anything. You gave them the task of binding three righteous Hebrews and throwing them into the furnace. And the flame overtook them and burnt them to death. You make no inquiry about that or how it happened or what. but this. Simply put, didn't we cast three men into the midst of the fire? And they said, true, O king. And he answered and said, lo, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of Elohim. See that? And they were originally bound, shackled when they were thrown in. But then after being placed in the furnace, suddenly they no longer bound. They had no restrictions. And they walking around and they got a co-defender. They got a counterpart. Three of them went in and one there with them, comforting them and protecting them in such a way that they ain't even burned. Talk about glorifying Yahweh even in the fire. They lived it. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near unto the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spoke. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High Yahweh. Come forth and come hither. Nah, no, nah, boy. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, whoa. Hey, now. Nah, whoa. Something special about them now. Nah. Whoa. That, that Elohim. Yeah. Meshach, Shadrach. Yeah. Y'all, y'all serve the most. Yahweh. Come, come, come on. Come on. Come on up out of here. But you, the one gave the command to put them in there because they wouldn't bow and bend before you. And the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors being gathered together, they saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor did the smell of fire pass on him. You think how we ain't able to provide that same type of protection for his people in the time of the tribulation and persecution? You think Yahweh ain't able to make you invisible in an age and this ever increasing police state where everything is on film, everything is photographed, every phone is tapped, no such thing as a dead mic, everything is being put on film, social media pages being monitored, emails being monitored, cell phone conversations, mail being monitored and intercepted, everything in which you think and you look in the view as a venue or an escape route or something they got eyes on everything but at the same time you think Yahweh ain't able to make you invisible you think Yahweh ain't able to make them lose sight of you altogether while you still right there in plain sight they do things that are meant for your harm and they do things that are meant for your evil but yet at the same time you think Yahweh ain't able to turn it around and allow the harm and the evil to go back to them and their household while simultaneously he makes it a blessing to you Then Nebuchadnezzar spake, and he said, Baruch be Yahweh, or blessed be Yahweh, the Elohim of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any Elohim except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which spake 
anything amiss against the Elohim of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other Elohim that can deliver after this sort. And that's serious. So you know what happened? Hey, to sum it up, as the saying goes, snitches get stitches. You read what Nebuchadnezzar said. He put out the command and anybody that spoke anything amiss or anybody that cracked slick or spoke out of term or anybody that got fly with the tongue against the Elohim of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, he commanded that they be cut in pieces. So all the folks, hey, man, look, they not worshiping your image. They ain't bending. They not bowing. All of them, they had to pay for what they did. And the king made a command that their houses be turned into dung hills. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He promoted them. So imagine that. The very people who you were upset with, you was enraged, you was angered with them, you wanted them put to death because they wouldn't bend and bow before you. But then in turn, when you looked up and you saw how Yahweh moved on their behalf, you said, nah, you know what? Oh, nope, 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 nah. I, I got to backtrack. I got to retract that. Nope. We're going to apologize. Anybody to talk disrespectfully for them, cut them in pieces and bring them over here to me. Bring, bring them three over here. Hey, look, y'all, promotions, get your stuff, empty out your cubicles, get, get rid of that. Nope, nope, nah. Going over here to something better. See how y'all we moved on the behalf of his people? Because they stood tall, they remained steadfast. And then in the midst of all the persecution, Yahweh fought those that persecuted him. And that's serious right there, man. Hey, that right there ought to stand anybody up. Anybody that's truly serving Yahweh, that right there should solidify your relationship. Knowing that you serve that same Elohim, man come and bind you. The mightiest men in the king's army come to bind you and throw you in the furnace and they in turn get killed right after. And then the most high allows the same flame that devoured them to not even so much as touch you to the point where you come out of the furnace. You don't even smell like smoke. Not one hair of your hair burned. That's serious. And just wait until almighty Yahweh does some of those same things for us. Because the one thing about it now, they went through their testimony. They went through their trials. They suffered. They had to go through it. They felt whatever it was that they may have felt. Whatever. You know the human range of emotions. You go through a thing. A person could look as if they have no fear whatsoever as they're doing something. But we don't know the underlying fear that may be present that they just power their way through. We don't know how these brothers may have been feeling while going through it, but yet at the same time, one thing we do know is they remain steadfast. They kept hold of their faith in Almighty Yahweh. So as your adversaries turn up the heat on you, as they tighten the noose on your neck, know of a surety. Yahweh ain't going to let them do that to you always and not feel the same pinch themselves. So as things get tighter for us, know of a surety. Things going to get tighter for the wicked as well. And also know of a surety that Yahweh is able to provide for his people a table even in the wilderness. So dear family, on that note, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to put this car in park. And we're going to stand to our feet and close out in prayer. Almighty Father, we come before you on this evening. We give total and hosannas unto your Kodesh name for Baruch and each and every one of us to be able to gather in observation of another seventh day Shabbat. We total you for watching over us all and we ask of you to please be with us this evening. Those of us to travel, watch over us every step of the way. Father, allow us to reach our destination safely and grant all of Israel the opportunity to lie down tonight to be able to sleep in great comfort and great peace. Allow us to lie down and meditate upon your word and baruch us with the opportunity to tomorrow to awake in the right and proper frame of mind. Keep our minds focused and stayed on you. Baruch every aspect of Israel's service. Baruch the hands, hearts, and minds of those who sing praises unto you. Baruch the hands, hearts, and minds of those who deliver your word, those who prepare any offerings unto you, Abba Yahweh. We ask of you that you please watch over all of your people. And every place in which you've caused your name to be placed there, we ask that you protect the borders in such a way that no evil spirit, no evil person with any evil intentions are allowed to be able to enter and find rest or comfort. 
put there, but make it so that they are forced to do nothing but get up and flee like lightning from out of the heavens. Father Yahweh, we ask these things of you, along with the persecution of Israel's adversaries and the deliverance of Israel from under their feet. In the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, we pray. Hallelujah, 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 way. Shabbat Shalom, Yisrael. We look forward to being here tomorrow with all of you that view online with us as well. Yahweh Barak you all. Shalom, shalom.